Hello friends and welcome to our last session of the Sabbath practice. I can't believe it's already been four weeks. We pray these early Sabbaths have been a delight and the last Sabbath especially and the Sabbath meal was a highlight. Even though we have arrived at our final session, this is just the beginning of a lifelong journey into Sabbath. If you stick with it, Sabbath will slowly but surely change the trajectory of your entire life. So before we go into the final teaching, let's take a few minutes to reflect on last week's practice. If you have your practice reflection with you, pull it out. Here are the questions. Where did you feel resistance in the Sabbath practice? And two, where did you feel delight? And third, where did you most experience God's nearness? Take the next few minutes to talk and then we'll wrap up our practice. What is your Sabbath like? Here's what Sunday is like for a lot of modern Western Christians. You stay up late on Saturday night watching a movie or TV or going to a party. You overeat, possibly overdrink. You wake up Sunday morning in a bit of a fugue and rush out the door to church in a hurry. That is, if we go to church, more and more people don't. After church, you go shopping or watch the game on TV or work around the house or in the yard. Maybe you get ahead on email and plan out your work week or you meal prep or you do homework or whatever. Then you watch another movie at night and go to bed too late. To clarify, that's not a Sabbath. That's what the late pastor Eugene Peterson called a bastard Sabbath, the unacknowledged offspring of the ancient practice from the way of Sabbath and the modern secular day off. It's what people in our church have taken to calling sabbish, meaning kind of Sabbath, but not really. Because we've been teaching on and practicing Sabbath for so many years in our church, it's woven into the culture of our community. But as you can imagine, people are at all different places in their practice. It's common to hear someone ask, how was your Sabbath? And then hear, oh, fine, I slept in, I read scripture for a while, it was quiet. Then I had to catch up on laundry, organize my garage, and work on my taxes. But then I had a great afternoon. I binged all of season three of whatever on the couch. It was, you know, sabbish. How do we keep Sabbath from becoming sabbish, from becoming just another activity on the weekend? As we've said through this entire practice, there are four movements to the Sabbath. Stop, rest, delight, and worship. In our final session, we come to what is arguably the most important of all four. The Sabbath is a day for worship. Now, where does this idea come from? Let's read one last time from Genesis 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Notice two things God did on the Sabbath. One, God blessed the seventh day. We covered that in the last session. The word blessed or barak in Hebrew can also be translated to make happy the Sabbath. It is a happy day. But secondly, God made it holy. I know holy is very religious sounding, but stay with me because this is fascinating. In the ancient Near East, the gods were found in the world of space, not of time, just meaning they were found on a holy mountain or in a holy temple or in a holy cave. So you would expect God to make a holy place, but instead, God makes a holy day. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel called the Sabbath architecture in time and said, the Sabbaths are our great cathedrals because for this God, the one true creator God, the entire cosmos is his temple and there is nowhere he is not. 
So if you want to find this God, you don't need to climb a mountain or travel to a shrine. He's all around you. You just need to stop and rest and delight and come awake and alive to who he is. But what exactly does it mean to make a day holy? In Hebrew, the word holy is kadash, and it literally means unique or special or uncommon. Theological definition would be set aside for God's special purposes. We tend to think of holiness as a moral descriptor, as a way of saying something or someone is good or evil. And in a sense it is. Contrary to our humanistic culture's view, goodness, or what the ancients called virtue, has always been a minority position in society as a whole. As Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. The narrow way of Jesus is holy. It's uncommon goodness. But holiness isn't just a moral word. In the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, there are holy pots and holy pans and holy utensils for the tabernacle. Now, a fork or knife can't be good or evil, but it can be set apart for God's special purposes. In that case, just for worship in the temple and not used for family dinner on a Tuesday night. Growing up, I remember my grandparents had a set of fine china. My grandfather used to travel to Japan for work a few times a year, and over the years, he collected a beautiful set of high-quality Japanese china. It was kept in a special piece of furniture called a hutch with glass windows to display the plateware, and it was only brought out on special occasions, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner or a celebration. Then they had a whole other set of plateware that was for everyday use, that was much cheaper, it was more hardy, it was easy to replace. The china was kadosh, it was holy. It was set apart for my family's special purposes, not used for everyday life. What my grandparents find China was to daily plateware, the Sabbath is to the rest of the week, holy, set apart. But the question is, for what? Or better said, for who? If your Bible is still open, turn over to Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 23, Moses said to the people of Israel, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Note that phrase. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. So the people rested on the seventh day. Notice the phrase, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. That can be translated set apart for the Lord or dedicated to the Lord. The Sabbath is an entire day that is set aside, not just for stopping or resting or delighting, but for God himself. Put another way, it is a day for worship. Now, a lot of us hear the word worship and we think of worship by singing at church. And that is an example of worship. But worship is so much more. In the biblical sense, to worship at its most primal level is to orient and reorient your entire life around God, our creator and our center. It's to lay your entire life before him in love and to deepen your surrender to his love. One way to do that is through worship by singing. But there are so many more ways, giving our time, our resources, our attention, and our affection to God in prayer, yielding our will over to God in decision-making. Anything we do to center our life on God and to intentionally direct and redirect our heart in love toward His glory in the language of Scripture, just meaning His goodness and His beauty, anything we do like that is a form of worship. Yes, the Sabbath is a day to stop and rest and refill our tank. And yes, it's a day to delight and throw a party and celebrate and feast. But above all, it's to contemplate the good news that God has given his life to us in Jesus. And now it is our joy 
to give our life back to God in worship. It's a day to deepen our communion with the deepest reality there is. This is the final and most important movement of Sabbath, worship. And in my experience, there is a progression that I observe my own soul go through on the Sabbath. First, I stop. Then I begin to rest. I fall asleep. I have some time. My energy starts to come back. Then I begin to have enough energy in my tank to delight, to really just savor goodness. But as I delight, I almost can't help but burst into spontaneous worship and gratitude and praise and wonder and awe at the goodness of God. By the end of the Sabbath, I often find myself on a quiet walk or with my family just looking up the sky and quietly saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Not because I'm Mr. Spiritual and certainly not because I'm a pastor, but because I made space for my soul to come back awake and alive to God's goodness. Ruth Haley Barton, in her chapter on Sabbath in her book, Sacred Rhythms, writes, I know what it's like to rest for hours until I have the energy to delight in something. Good food, a good book, a leisurely walk, a long-awaited conversation with someone I love. I know what it's like to feel joy and hope and peace flow back into my body and soul, though I had thought it might never come again. I know what it's like to see my home and my children through the Sabbath eyes of enjoyment. I know what it's like to have rest turn into delight, and delight turn into gratitude, and gratitude into worship. This is one of the many reasons that, for most of you, Sunday is by far the best day to Sabbath. For over a thousand years, Sabbath and Sunday worship were synonymous. Only recently were they separated, but they were intended to go together. And the tragic way the Sabbath has been co-opted by the weekend from a day of worship to a day off goes to the heart of the matter. The Sabbath is holy, but we have to keep it holy. In the Ten Commandments, we read, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The Jews don't talk about practicing the Sabbath, but keeping the Sabbath, meaning keeping it holy holy, keeping it set apart for God's special purposes. They call this sanctifying the day, treating it as special and unique and not like the other six. You see, we can either sanctify the Sabbath and keep it holy, or we can, in the language of Scripture, profane the Sabbath, meaning we can devalue it, dishonor it, treat it just like any other day for doing as we please. What about you? Do you keep the Sabbath holy or do you profane it? What about me? Because ultimately, this isn't about a day, but about your life. Remember, all the practices of Jesus are a means to an end. The Sabbath is a day of worship by which we cultivate a spirit of worship in all the days of our lives. Is your life holy? Is your life set apart for and dedicated to God and His special purposes in the world? Is it a life of uncommon goodness? Or is your life, is mine, profane, common, following the broad path that is all around you? My aim here is not to guilt trip you into going to church more often or doing all sorts of spiritual disciplines on the Sabbath. It's just to drive home that the Sabbath is of life or death importance. Followers of Jesus, as you know, disagree about whether or not the Sabbath is still a binding command. Whoever is right, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And all of the commandments of Scripture, but especially the Ten, are put there to guard you from death and guide you into life. As Moses said of the commandments in Deuteronomy, I set before you this day life or death choose. Keeping the Sabbath is arguably just as important as not lying or stealing or killing. It is of life or death importance. Our culture is killing itself through overwork, overconsumption, overactivity. We are, as Neil Postman famously said, amusing ourselves to death. Few things are as desperately needed today as the recovery of the ancient practice of Sabbath. 
The Sabbath is a means by which we enter into what Jesus called the kingdom of God or the reign of God. It's a day when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Theologians point out that the Sabbath is a signpost that looks both backward and forward in history. It's an aftertaste of the Garden of Eden and a foretaste of the New Jerusalem. When we gather for the Sabbath meal around a table with the multi-ethnic family of God, not just friends, but family, kin, brothers, sisters, bound together not by blood, but by allegiance to Jesus the Lord, our host and our honored guest. We eat the bread, we drink the wine, and we give thanks and sing and laugh and dance and celebrate and revel in the sense that all is well. When we do that, that is not just a sign of salvation, that is salvation. Here's Abraham Joshua Heschel again. Unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath while still in this world, unless one is initiated into the appreciation of eternal life, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. The essence of the world to come is Sabbath eternal, and the seventh day in time is an example of eternity. On the Sabbath, we are practicing eternity. And what makes the Sabbath such a joy isn't just good food around a table of family and friends and time off work to sleep and rest. It is God himself, the Trinitarian community at the center of the universe who radiates love and joy and peace. This is what we crave deep in our being. Whether we put the name God to our ache or misdiagnose our desire for God as a desire for someone or something else. The danger of last session's teaching on the Sabbath as delight is, as with all ideas, the enemy is constantly at work to warp and corrupt good ideas from reality to parody. We can easily be confused in our hedonistic culture into kind of thinking that the Sabbath, rather than a Godward day of joy, is a self-centered day of pleasure. But anyone who has ever tasted of true delight and the joy of God as the creator intended for the creation, you know there is a chasm of difference between delight and pleasure or hedonism. Delight is meant to draw your whole being to God in joy. Pleasure is just trying to make your body feel good. You don't walk away from pleasure feeling profound gratitude. You just walk away wanting more pleasure. But there is a kind of delight that is virtually indistinguishable from worship. To end, the social critic and novelist David Foster Wallace, in a famous commencement address, said this about worship. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type of thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, and always on the verge of being found out, and so on. The question isn't, do you worship? It's who or what do you worship? And if we become like who or what we worship, as all the great wisdom traditions have long said, then what kind of person is your worship forming you into? You will worship something. You will orient your life around something. Put your faith, hope, and love onto something. Find your identity, community, and a sense of meaning and purpose and even morality in something. You will pursue it, sacrifice for it, discipline yourself for it, love it. The question is simply, what? And no matter how good or noble a pursuit is, the moment we elevate a created thing to a place reserved for the creator, we immediately ruin it and in doing so, ruin ourselves because nothing can bear up under the weight of our worship other than the Father and the Son and the Spirit. All week long, 
the false gods of the world lure us out of our circle around God in a kind of orbital decay, invisible yet pulling us down with power. They all promise us rest and a sense of joy, yet all they give is the weariness and emptiness of soul the Western world has honed to perfection. On the Sabbath, we come back to what the Quakers used to call our holy center in God. This point, deep within all of us who have been baptized, who are in Christ, where our spirit is in communion with His spirit, where we're not even sure who's who anymore, where we draw on the life at the heart of the Trinity itself and give our life back in return. The Sabbath is a day for worship. Hey everyone, we've come to our final discussion time where we get to put it all together. Here are a few discussion questions to give shape to your conversations. Number one, in what ways is it easy for your practice of Sabbath to become savage, more of a day off than a day of worship? Number two, how do you enjoy God? What practices, disciplines, or activity bring you genuine joy in God? And third, what false gods are you tempted to worship? Which, while they may be very good things or not, they pull you away from your holy center in God. Enjoy your last conversation. Sabbath is countercultural because it asks you to stop. And if I've noticed anything from my workspace or culture, it seems like the hustle is glorified. It's almost like if you don't stop, then how will you get your dreams, which isn't actually true. So I feel like Sabbath says no in a very rebellious way, but in a gentle way, because it says, no, I refuse to be a slave to my desires. My biggest motivation to continue Sabbath is who I'm becoming. I find that I'm becoming a more restful person. I pay more attention to my surroundings. And I don't always get that right because some weeks I'm like, that wasn't really restful. <laughs> what should I do next week? That's different, you know? But I think choosing to engage and choosing to come back, I do find that I'm becoming more like him. I'm not in an uber spiritual way, but in a I'm facing myself way. Like, oh, this thing is hurting you. You should probably process that with Jesus so he can meet you where you are. But I, I love who I'm becoming. I feel like I'm more reliant on people as well. So my Sabbaths are a mix of time by myself and time at the table with uh, Sabbath kin. So it looks like Friday dinners, eating Tam's bread and laughing by the fireplace. So I do feel like I'm being formed by being around people who whose vision is Jesus, who want to become more like him, who have a fire in their heart for what he's given them. So who I'm becoming is my biggest motivation and the gift of his presence in those moments, especially when the weeks are chaotic. When I just pause, I'm like, everything's okay. He's still here and he's present. So it helps me be in tune with his voice. Sabbath is a day for worship. For our final week's exercise, the plan. Number one, to practice a light and life-giving version of what the ancients called fixed hour prayer. All that means is you pause two to three times over your 24-hour Sabbath to pray. By prayer here, I don't necessarily mean intercessory prayer where you intercede before God on behalf of the needs of yourself or others, because that is a form of work. For that reason, in some traditions, all intercessory prayer is forbidden on the Sabbath. That may be extreme, but the intent is right. By prayer, I mean a kind of prayer that is more like resting than working. Prayer at its most basic is the reorientation of your heart to God in gratitude and worship. The most ancient, and for many people, including myself, the most helpful way to do this is by praying a psalm. 
But you can also do this by listening to worship music or praying with a friend or going on a walk in nature. The end goal is to spend as much of the Sabbath as you possibly can in conscious communion with God, just receiving his love for you and giving back your love for him. Number two, identify two or three practices by which you enjoy God and do them. It's key to discover what Gary Thomas calls your spiritual pathways, the way you're uniquely wired to enjoy God. For you, this could be time in the quiet, alone, stillness, or it could be throwing a rowdy party with your community. It could be walking in nature or reading a novel by the fire. It could be an emotional experience, or it could be study of theology or reading or philosophy. However you enjoy God, whatever the practices are for you, that when you do them, you just love every minute, do a few of them this coming Sabbath. For those of you doing the REACH exercise, this week's exercise is to spend an extended portion of your Sabbath in silence and solitude. There's a special kind of stillness that we get access to on the Sabbath. See if you can tap into that. We're also reading The End of Sabbath by Dan Allender and listening to the rest of the Sabbath podcast series from Practicing the Way. For all of you in your guide, at the back we have a keep going section where you have more recommended reading to keep learning about the Sabbath, as well as a number of exercises for you to adopt as you desire. You're not going to master this practice in four weeks. This practice you're wrapping up is designed to get you moving in the right direction on a lifelong journey from anxious striving to resting in God. It's designed to be integrated into your rhythm of life and for you to come back to every seven days until you die and enter into that Sabbath rest of eternity. You have to decide if you want it. We've done our very best to inspire you, but your motivation has to be stronger than our inspiration. Finally, may the God of rest fill you with His peace and presence as you rest in Him. <laughs>